So here it is, finally, the follow-up to the Mavic 2 Pro. This is the Mavic 3 Cine version, which is the same as the Pro, just with a few extra bells and whistles that will cost you a fair bit more. This has an internal SSD of one terabyte to record ProRes HQ on, and it comes with a smart controller, which is very nice. Other than that, it's the same as the Pro, and it's a very nice follow-up with a few strange decisions and some operating things, which uh, specifically to workflow, which I'm a little bit perplexed about, and that's specific to the Cine version. Let me explain. Let's address the big question right away. Is the Mavic 3 better than the Mavic 2 Pro? Well, yes, of course it is. The follow-up, it's been almost three and a half years. They're not gonna release a worse one, are they? It's better in almost every way. But there are some deep frustrations that I have. And I think a lot of them can be fixed with firmware. Some of them can't. There's a lot to cover in this review, and that's why I've split it up into two. I know a lot of people have short attention spans, so hopefully this will be a bit more manageable for you. But, uh, eh, it works best as a whole, so just play them one after another. The original Mavic Pro, which I will refer to as the OG from now on, came out in 2016, and it was a big deal at the time. DJI's first folding drone. This was portable drone heaven. The old phantom shape had become synonymous with bad press and so having this new design was actually really good and it was still really stable and much smaller in the air too. Goodbye Mavic. So that along with the brand new and really rather marvellous super slow tripod mode which limited speed to just one meter a second made my obsession with flying backwards through anything that was there so much easier. This was a groundbreaking drone, but yes, there's always a big part. The compromise was the image quality. The Phantom 4 Pro released earlier that year had the best image out of any fixed lens drone from DJI thanks to its one inch sensor, frame rates, codec, and image control. The image from the OG in comparison really was a big step back in many ways. Partly due to its much smaller sensor, but also a heavily compressed 8-bit codec, the 4K being recorded at just 60 megabits per second in H.264. You really need a good strong codec for drone filming, as so much of it is deep depth of field and constantly moving, making compressing the footage a nightmare for the drone. The P4 Pro has H.265 recording at a much higher and more efficient bitrate. So along with the bigger sensor, the difference of the image quality was really night and day. Most of the image issues with compression, noise, etc. Most people don't actually notice, especially if you're looking on a mobile phone. And of course, once it's uploaded to YouTube, a lot of things like noise actually get compressed away. You did have the ability to tweak your image settings in the app for things like sharpening, contrast, etc. Didn't help. In fact, it just seemed to make the image too soft, like you were adding a blur. Disappointing image, it was still a lovely drone thanks to the size and the ease of using it. 
When I wanted a better image quality though, I used the P4 Pro. When I needed convenience and I had no space to carry a bigger drone, I used the OG. If only I had that way superior camera system with the one inch sensor that the Phantom 4 Pro had. Fast forward to the summer of 2018, two new drones came out with the name Mavic 2, the Zoom and the Pro, but I'm just looking at the Pro models here. So I'm gonna call the Mavic 2 Pro the 2P from now on, actually. Then. Let's change that to, not quite accurate, but you know, 2P, old money, it's tuppence, let's just call it tuppence. If I keep calling it to P, you're gonna to wanna to keep going to the loo. Oh yeah, where was I? Oh yeah. Back to the summer of 2018, Tuppence arrived with a similar form factor to the OG, but with a massively superior camera. Although in some respects, still not as good as the one in the P4 Pro. It had the same one-inch sensor, but no 4K 50p, 60p. You had to drop to 2.7K for that. But I didn't use slow motion that much in my drone footage, so it wasn't that big a deal. What was a big deal was that Tuppence has 10-bit D-Log and HLG recording in H.265, which was a huge improvement over the OG. It was also the first DJI drone to make use of the part DJI owned Hasselblad name. Although it was just limited to the color processing, not the hardware. Many people complained about the D-Log image as it had very little processing no optics distortion correction, little to no noise reduction, and no artificial sharpening. All of these were a huge plus in my book. Like the OG, Tuppence also has those image control options to let you tweak your image parameters, including the sharpening, and they all worked really well. To get the most detailed image and technically the best looking footage, you had to switch from the line skip full sensor mode to the one-to-one -one sampling HQ mode this did narrow your field of view substantially from the 28 millimeter full sensor to a 35 millimeter full frame equivalent. That being said, I used these two different field of views quite a lot. I used the full frame mode when I needed to be a bit wider and if I wanted to be tighter, I just went to HQ mode. It also featured a lot of fancy features like active tracking of subjects and really great omnidirectional obstacle avoidance system. Although not perfect, as there were some blind spots. Tuppence was and is an absolute joy to use, especially combined with the still wonderful tripod mode, because I like to fly backwards through anything that's there. I think it's very important to have this history in context so we know what we have here, but we can concentrate on talking about the Mavic 3 and Mavic 3 Silly finally. Yeah, the pro name seems to no longer be part of the branding. No idea why. We have a dual camera system on here. The main camera is a 24 millimeter full frame equivalent. Uh, Hasselblad branded. I don't know how much of this though is hardware versus processing. I do know that the center is a Sony center, a four thirds one. I did say dual camera, didn't I? Rather than have a second camera, which is a 50 millimeter or 75 millimeter equivalent, we have, strangely, a 162 millimeter full frame equivalent, which is uh, very long. And it's on a half inch sensor as well. The fixed aperture f4.4. I don't know who was asking for this. It wasn't me. Was it you? If it was, own up. I mean, it definitely has its uses, its creative uses. But anyway, I'll talk about that later. Let's concentrate on the really nice camera first. The image from the main camera is very nice indeed. Of course, that's incredibly important when you're getting a new camera, whether it's one of these flying cameras or one of those boring ones that stay on the ground. But, yes, a big but. There are some caveats, especially when it comes to the codex and the resolutions. A very complex section, which is going to be later on in the review. When you're reviewing something as complex as this, you're always learning things the more you fly. It was certainly the case with three. Constantly learning things 
which changed my opinion, but also meant I needed to go out and retest. And that's why you probably noticed there is a lot of continuity jumps with what I'm wearing, amount of stubble, how tired I look, length of my hair. I'm sure you can deal with it. So you can get the most accurate information. Because I've had three for about two months or so, a lot of my tests were done with pre-release firmware. But she's now out and about, and people are using her. So this is based upon release firmware. Hi, how are you? You've got a nice place to live here, haven't you? You're a cutie, aren't you? I'm gonna name you Mavic. You've probably got a name, and of course you've got a name, but you're Mavic, because I've done so many Mavic tests here. Hi, Mavic. I gotta go, I'm running out of sun. Nice to meet you, Mavic. Just gotta find somewhere to put the drone down. There's a lot of features which are missing in 3 right now. These are things which will come later. Well, that's what DJI said. Yeah, I've done that joke before, sorry. I've got a uh, card in there. Yes. I'll pick up a bag when it's open. But what I do cover are pretty much the most important things anyway, the things I always focus on when doing drone reviews. A lot of the problems I do have with 3 are to do with the image. Not all of them, but a number of them. And these aren't things which are stated as coming in future firmware. But you are going to be watching this in the future because you're not sat here whilst I record my VO. So it's entirely possible that some of these will have been fixed by the time you do watch this. But I doubt very much that they're all going to be fixed. I don't make reviews trashing products because my time is really valuable. And I make so few reviews, I choose things which are really interesting to me, things that I want to use. And I make these to give you information to help you make decisions as to whether to buy a product, but also in the hope that this information can be used to improve the product. And I'm definitely more picky and generally harsher in this review than I was in my Air 2S review because she's so much more expensive. Reviews should always be about balance. And there's so many positive things, so many things about 3, which are really fantastic. And I will absolutely be covering those as well as the things I don't like. I will be referring to and showing some footage from the Air 2S a number of times in this review, on well, both parts. It's a very powerful drone with a one inch sensor and it is much cheaper than 3. It doesn't have all the features and has its own issues which I go in depth into in its own review. But it's certainly something which is really important to take into account when we look at what 3 can do and also what Tuppence can and can't do. One of my favorite things about 3 is the new gimp ball protector. Gone are those annoying plastic things that never stayed on. You could work out to put them on in the first place. Now we have this rather bold BDSM influence strap-on design, which is much better. 3 also tells me that she feels somewhat liberated whilst wearing it, and no longer tied to preconceptions and stereotypes based upon her appearance. I wonder if that was the intention. Size-wise, 3 is very similar to Tuppence. Surprisingly, she's a little bit lighter. Three batteries are 5,000 milliamps, 77 watt hours, whereas Tuppence's batteries are 3,850 milliamps and 59.29 watt hours. So combined with the larger battery and more aerodynamic body shape, you really are able to fly for longer. Battery life is quoted as about 46 minutes. I think that's maximum ideal conditions, which I don't know what that is. I'm not getting close to that. I'm getting more like 30 minutes and I'm not really, I don't fly fast, I'm low and slow, that's me. And I'm out, my three are flat. And that's why I'm having to continue talking to you with three in a tree. It's actually been averaging about 32 minutes recently, and this is still very good, way better than we've had before. And it really helps when I'm doing the piece to cameras because I fluff them a lot. And when you've got to get your timing right, oh, you 
to do the whole battery just trying to do one single piece of the camera. I got my words right every single time. Honestly. <laughs> sort of. I blame the lack of tripod mode on 3. And I'll address that in part 2. So I am one battery down, but I have two more that came with the Cine kit and one more that I bought myself. Uh, can you charge them on the go? Yes, yeah, sort of. You'll need the three-way charger crate that comes with the fly more or the Cine kit. Put it in here. This is a 90, oh, no, 77 watt hour battery. This is a 97 watt hour battery. Will it charge it? Yes, but it will basically just more or less drain this one and a half hour later nine percent so yeah you're basically swapping the juice from this into this well it's useful because i can't fly with this i get one more flight Having a larger sensor means we can get a bit more shallow depth of field and we can with tuppence. But this is an f2.8 lens though, so you need to manage your expectations. But we can also get shallow depth of field with the Air 2S, which also has the same sensor size as tuppence. And the reason we can do that is because that has a minimum focus distance of 60 centimetres, tuppence is one metre, which is the same as three. But the larger sensor that evens things out, and it is better to be a metre from your subject to get some shadow depth field and have to be 60 centimetres away. So definitely a win for three here. But uh, it's still quite difficult to get some really shadow depth field. You really need a 0.95 Voigt lander on here. Some counterweight, maybe we could do it. Hmm. With a larger sensor, you do need to make sure you're in focus even more so. Most times you can be in infinity, but sometimes you are going to want to focus up closer. There is manual focus and autofocus. There's no fixed focus like the smaller sensor drones. So is it any good? Is it keeping me in focus? What sort of system is it using? Is it continuous? Is it contrast based? Where will we see it jump? How well will it work as it comes up to my face? That's the key thing. Okay, you can stop right there. DJI call their autofocus system vision detection autofocus technology and it uses the camera sensors to make sure the lens is in focus. It's not the same as the excellent LiDAR system in the Ronin 4D. It hasn't got the focus right on a number of my pieces to cameras but I think the main reason this is happening is because you need to touch your subject that you want to be in focus on the app screen but when I'm doing piece to cameras I'm a bit busy. Three can record up to 50p in 5.1K, and in 4K can go up to 120 frames per second. With the Air 2S to shoot in 4K 50p or 60p, you need to crop in on the sensor one to one. The quality's still great; it's just a tighter field of view, which can be seen as a plus and a negative. We're a total bunch of complainers. We'll always find something to focus on that we don't like. And there's things which definitely I have said in this review that I wish it didn't do. The Air 2S is a fantastic drone. The lack of tripod mode is one of my biggest gripes, but also it's a shame that the 4K 50p, 60p crops. It doesn't do that here, not in any of the modes. But you know what? I wish it did actually have a mode that cropped a 4K one-to-one -one sampling rather than the oversampling they all have. Because sometimes it's nice to just have that extra bit of length. Actually, there is one mode that crops, and that's the 4K 120 frames per second, which is what I'm filming in right now. Overall, this is the best 4K 120 frames per second I've seen from a DJI drone. Although it's not quite as detailed as the lower frame rates. Now there's been this looming big but that I've been hinting at throughout this video and it affects this mode too. And I will get to it, 
eventually. I promise. But if you've been pixel peeping and paying attention, you may already be onto it. Of course, we have 10 bit recording in three, just like we have in Tuppence. We will have HLG, although it's not in there right now. It will be in future firmware with lots of other things. But we do have H.265 with a high bit rate, and we also have H.264. And if you have the money for the Cine version, you can get the rather bloated ProRes HQ, and there's no other version of the ProRes. It is just HQ, which is the same as my iPhone 13 Pro. I don't understand why they just put this in there. It's crazy. It's huge sizes. At least the Filmic Pro, I can choose smaller ones. But to be honest with you, the H265 codec of this is absolutely fine. With this, with the HQ, we of course cannot write to a micro SD card. The files are just too big. The bit rate's too much. So that's why there is an internal one terabyte SSD, which will fill up pretty quickly with ProRes HQ. And it's this internal non-removable media, which is the cause of a lot of our workflow issues. So let me go through the problems as you come across them. Firstly, as the media is non-removable, this means you cannot follow one of the most important bits of advice I give to people in real life when using drones and in my drone masterclass. This is my number one tip. You may call it being a little bit paranoid, but I think you should need to be paranoid when flying drones. You really do. The tip is simple, is that once you've flown a bit and brought it back, change the card, put another one in just in case anything happens. And that shows you just the sort of mentality you need to get into. But the simplest thing when you are flying is have three or four SD cards, micro SD depending on what you're flying, and swap them out each time. This for me, not being able to swap my media if I'm recording in ProRes HQ, scares the crap out of me. The whole point of swapping out each time you come down is in case something happens. Things can happen, and if it's all on your internal SSD, well, that's it. It's all gone, isn't it? So what options do you have that can make using ProRes HQ on the Mavic 3 Cine workable? Well, nothing that I think is realistic, to be honest with you. I can pull the footage off of that SSD using my NAR box in the field, and that will go to its internal one terabyte SSD or another drive which I can connect to it. But this just takes too long because those files are so big. When I bring my drone down to swap batteries, I don't have time for this. I want to be down and up pretty quickly. With just one battery, you could easily fill a third of that one terabyte SSD up if you're recording at 5.1K 50p and are recording most of the time. And that will take about 20 minutes to offload using the NAR box or a laptop. I'm all for taking breaks, but they really need to be at the right time, not when I'm in the middle of actually flying my drone. I filled up my one terabyte SSD on a number of occasions, and that's when I'm forced to call it a day. So once I get home, the first thing I do is cuddle the cats, and then I put the batteries on charge. It takes about one and a half hours to fully charge one battery. Once that one battery is done, I'll put it into three, connect her up to the computer, using their fast transfer cable, and the quickest way to offload is to another SSD. If you're offloading to a standard 7200 RPM hard drive, you may not get the offload finished before that battery runs out. The quickest I've offloaded a full SSD has been about 50 minutes. The amount of time it takes to do this is frankly ridiculous. Offloading directly from a camera is frankly ridiculous. Having to wait for a battery to charge before you can even start offloading is frankly ridiculous. If this became my main drone for the next two or three years and I was using this workflow, the amount of my life that would be lost to it would be, well, decades. And just think of the things I could achieve in that time.
Yes, maybe I'm exaggerating a little bit, but are these clips I downloaded from Soyblocks, the sponsor of this video, really that unbelievable? I think I could have done most of these during just the offload procedure that I went through so many times for the making of this review. The time it took to find these clips was frankly far from ridiculous. I've been using Storyblocks for over a year and I love this ability to just pull out silly things like this for my fun segues, but also for more serious stuff. Yes, I do though sometimes. With my unlimited plan, I can download and use as many of the millions of royalty-free clips, music, sound effects, and templates as I want. And there's three different plans to suit your needs. To learn more, just click the link in the description below. Ah, oh, good, finished. I can look at this footage now. I'm gonna turn off this stupid light. Much better. So with the offload done to one hard drive, yes, you should be offloading to two for a proper backup. I then convert the clips to ProRes LT as I just don't have the storage for that codec. But yes, this is just more time wasted, which is frankly ridiculous. There is one solution that you could use, which would let you keep your Mavic 3 in the air whilst offloading on the ground. And that is by a second three, you just rotate them. When one's flying, one's offloading. But yeah, that's frankly ridiculous. Having an internal SSD only for ProRes HQ forces me to fly and forces me to manage my data in the way that goes against everything that I've learned over the years. I really don't like this decision. DJI told me that having removable media would have added too much weight and therefore reduced the flying time. Yeah, I can see that. After all, the SSD that's inside three weighs just four grams. The one terabyte SSD of the DJI Ryan 4D is 44 grams, but that is a pretty solid little SSD. Personally, I'd rather have had a little bit less flight time and removable media. The amount of pixel peeping that I've done for this review is absolutely ridiculous, more than most people care about. But it's important for me to know how to get the best image out of your camera. It's irrelevant what people watch it on, mobile phones. You start with the best you can. That's the start of the pipeline. And of course, ProRes HQ D-Log is going to give you the best of everything. Looking at the HQ, comparing it to the H265, can I see any differences in 5.1K? No, not really. But of course it is going to be more robust with heavy color grading. It's a much stronger codec. I mean, this is in 5.1K though, because things are a little bit different in 4K, because that's where things get complicated. 